Let's get into some anatomical detail here. First, the pharynx. Extends from the coani, the internal nares, or nares, to the level of the cricoid cartilage of the larynx. We'll talk about the different cartilages in a moment. But look at the um, illustration on the left. So you have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Three different regions of the throat. So um, it goes all the way down then, as it says, from where the internal nares are all the way down to your larynx, which is where your vocal cords are. So three different regions of your throat. You normally don't think of your throat, or most people don't, the part that's the nasopharynx. Um, you think of the throat as being where, the, where your mouth ends, you know, at the back end of your oral cavity. But in fact, that part right there behind the nasal cavity is technically part of the pharynx. And pharynx, in general, we use the word throat, the informal term. So it moves air and food to distal location. So notice this is an overlap of function. This is really part of both the digestive system and the respiratory system, because both air and food are going down. Remember, it contains openings to your auditory tubes. It used to be called the eustachian tubes. You learned that in Bio 201. goes up to your middle ear. That's... Um, why uh, little kids sometimes, you know, they get a cold and then, you know, the irritation, the virus, the inflammation goes up the auditory tube and ends up shutting off the middle ear. And that's when kids get those horrible middle ear infections and wake up screaming in the middle of the night. So the throat connects to the ears. That's also why, like when you go up in an airplane or drive up a mountain, you feel your ears pop, people say. What's going on is you're just equalizing the pressure between the inside of your, your well, between your middle ear and between the outside world. <clears throat> Our tonsils are here. So you have three sets of tonsils. We looked at those before. The um, pharyngeal tonsil is up at the, behind your nasal cavity, up at the top of your um, uh, nasopharynx. Then you have the two palatine tonsils. Remember, we looked at these when we did the lymph uh, lymphatic system and immune system. The two palatine tonsils guard the entrance to the throat, and then you've got the lingual tonsils on the back of the tongue. Um, the wall, mostly skeletal muscle lined by mucous membranes. So the, the boundaries, the so-called wall of your pharynx, yes, you do have the hard palate there, but most of the rest of it is just a, a, a tissue barrier, um, which has got skeletal muscles lined by mucous membranes. Mucous membranes, again, one of the, the malt brothers, you know, trying to catch the bad guys and skeletal muscles for speaking and swallowing. So the divisions, again, are the nasopharynx. That's down to the end of the soft palate. The end of the soft palate is where the uvula is, the little punching bag. So from the uvula up, that's nasopharynx. Then the oropharynx goes down to the hyoid bone. Remember from Bio 201, the hyoid bone? You can see it there in the lower ref, left diagram. Um, I guess it's, uh, it's not labeled, is it? But you can see there. You can see that little chunk of bone, and then the um, laryngopharynx, uh, also called the hypopharynx because it's below everything else. That goes down to the vocal folds, which we call your vocal cords as well, all right? So the three different regions of the pharynx, in general, the word pharynx, again, means throat. So you've got the basically the nose throat, the mouth throat, and the larynx throat, Okay. Now then, the larynx in particular, because um, it's got a lot of parts to it, and we've got a lot of cartilages guarding that region. So it's a very short passageway connecting the laryngopharynx to the trachea, only about four centimeters long, two and a half centimeters to an inch, so that's less than two inches, all right? So you can look in the illustration there, get a, get, take a moment to check that out. You can see lots of different cartilages there, all right? And I want you to know those cartilages. The primary function of the larynx is to provide what we call a patent airway. That means an airway that stays open no matter what. So remember we said that a lot of your pharynx is just basically soft tissue, skeletal muscle. Well, it would be possible for that to collapse on itself, and then you wouldn't be able to breathe. So the purpose of the cartilages is to make sure that... In in particular, when you're swallowing food, when it goes down the esophagus, that you've got a hard cartilaginous tube 
that guarantees that it'll stay open. That's why you can breathe and swallow at the same time, all right? So the larynx, very important. Make sure that you will be able to breathe. Those cartilages are going to keep it open no matter what. Keep food and ingested fluids out of your airways, all right? So we may want to make sure that fluid and food goes down the esophagus and that air goes down the trachea. And we'll see the cartilages are going to help do that. Then, additionally, it produces sound. This is where your vocal cords are. Nine separate pieces of cartilage. So let's take a look. The thyroid cartilage is what people call the Adam's apple. That's the big shield. So look on the on the left on the right side of the illustration, on the leftmost on the right side. You get what I'm saying? See how there's a big shield there? It says thyroid cartilage, Adam's apple. There it is. Huge shield protects the front of your throat. That's really for protective purposes as well. So if you get hit in the throat by something, you know, it's not going to completely collapse everything. You've got hard cartilage to try to maintain a patent airway. Then the cricoid. So the cricoid is right below it. See right below? Look at the illustration on the right. You can see the cricoid below. In between is the cricothyroid ligament. Okay. So notice for a moment that the thyroid cartilage is huge on the front. But look what happens. It basically disappears on the back, on the posterior side. On the other hand, look at the cricoid. The cricoid is just a little tiny band in the front. But then look on the back side. It's now a huge chunk of cartilage. Then the arytenoid or arytenoid cartilages, that's where the vocal folds attach, your vocal cords, all right? So you can see there's a, in the lower illustration now, you can see the arytenoid cartilage and then you can see the true vocal cord, also called the vocal fold, which is attached to it. Those are basically just like little ligamentous structures that vibrate when air passes through them, and that's how you make sound. The cornicular cartilage, so up at the top of the arytenoid, um, if you look on the uh, right illustration now, you can see their little horns. So corn in Latin means horn. So the little corniculate cartilages up on top are the little horns on top of the arytenoid cartilages. And then the epiglottis is the big giant trapdoor. So on the right, far right illustration, see that big leaf-shaped trapdoor? What happens is when you swallow, the epiglottis goes down and covers your trachea. And the purpose is, obviously, so that when you swallow food, it doesn't go down your trachea, all right? That's because the big giant trap door, the big giant epiglottis goes down and plomp, it covers up the trachea so that hopefully all the food goes down your esophagus. Of course, you've managed to be so un uncoordinated at times, haven't you, that you managed to defeat the actions of your own epiglottis. And you managed to get, f it's usually water, it could be food as well, actually down into your trachea a little bit, that's when you have the massive coughing fit for like the next 10 minutes. We say that it went down the wrong pipe. Yeah, it's because you were such an uncoordinated dumbass that you managed to um, defeat the purpose of your own epiglottis and allow food to get down your trachea. So um, these are four of my former students. That's Emily on the far left, then McKenna, then Stephanie, and then Alex. All four of them are now RNs. All right, and the three girls are married. I'm not sure if Alex is married yet or not, um, but I know he's, he's got a serious long-term girlfriend, so if they're not married, they're going to be pretty soon. But all four of them sat in the front row of my class. Um, they actually sat uh, spanning two tables, but they were basically all together in one blob. And when I first talked about how the thyroid cartilage was big in the front and small in the back, and the... Uh, Cricoid cartilage was small in the front and big in the back. McKenna, and this is what McKenna was like. McKenna said, oh, so that's like me and Stephanie. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm big in the front and small in the back, and Stephanie is small in the front and big in the back. And I said, oh, my God, I can't believe you said that. But then the whole class thought it was hilarious. And um, then McKenna said, well, why don't we get a picture? I said, okay, we can. So we went right outside the classroom. We took the picture. Um, Stephanie wasn't cooperating at first. I said, Stephanie, your butt isn't out far enough. Stick your butt out farther. So she said, okay. So there we got McKenna. Those are 38 double Ds, by the way. McKenna would always remind you if you didn't know. 
Um, so those are McKenna's 38 double D's, big in front, small in back, and there's Stephanie, small in front. She had little 34 B's, I think, and uh, she was big in the back. All right, so there you go. Thyroid, big in front, small in back. Cricoid, small in front, big in back. And there's McKenna. McKenna was my student assistant for a long time. She um, came to my classes and helped during lab. Um, she was great. McKenna and I used to go out for lunch together. Actually, whole, all the people in that photo, we always used to go to the baseball games here in Tucson. Because we used to have dollar beer night. We would all go down there. For, that was the cheapest drunk in town, by the way. So sad that baseball's not here anymore. But yeah, we used to go down there. We had a great time. So we all got to know each other a lot. I actually went to McKenna's 21st birthday party. Um, there's us with her friend Stephanie. So um, we actually hung out a lot together after the semester was over, of course. And McKenna graduated from nursing school at the top of her class. She got the special award for being the number one student in her nursing class. So McKenna's now working as an RN. She's a cool kid. She's awesome. Okay, talking about the larynx again, um, the glottis. So the glottis is the opening, basically the passageway, and you have two sets of folds. They're called vocal folds. The false vocal folds and the true vocal folds. So the false vocal folds, also called the ventricular folds, um, they are on top, and the true vocal folds, also called the vocal cords, are below. <clears throat> So on the left, see how there are the white bands? Those are the true vocal cords, all right? And um, those are what make the sound. And then the false vocal cords, uh, vocal folds, are above those. So what happens is, even if you were to lose your epiglottis, um, the false vocal folds will still close when you swallow in order to close off your trachea so that you don't get food and water down into your trachea, all right? So your body has a backup mechanism here. You have both the epiglottis, a big giant piece of cartilage we saw before, and also the false vocal folds. So the false vocal folds do not make sound. They just basically cover the trachea when you swallow. The true vocal folds are what you pass air through. And there you see it shows them when they're wide open on the left and when they're cut, where they're, they're shut, rather. Uh, when they're wide open, that's when you produce low sounds. And as they get closer together, you produce the high-pitched sounds. So that's how they work. It's by opening and closing to varying degrees that we get differences in pitch. The rima glottitis, rima means space, glottitis means of the glottis. <clears throat> so the glottis, again, is the whole area here. Um, the rima is the space in this area. So rima glottitis literally means the opening of the glottis, all right? It's the space between the true vocal cold folds. Um, they close when we swallow. So when on the, on the left illustration on the top part, when you see the two white bands open, the, two, the true vocal cords open, that's what's going on there. The space in between those two is the rima glottitis, okay? That is the space between them. And on the left-hand side there on the bottom illustration, Notice the rima glottitis has disappeared. Once the true vocal cords come together, then you no longer have the rima glottitis. Laryngitis simply means inflammation of the larynx. All right, itis, always inflammation. That happens sometimes from overuse. Like, you know, you go to a football game, you scream your lungs out, and you end up with a hoarse throat. By the way, the worst thing to do when you get that is to whisper. Try it right now. Talk in a low voice or try to whisper. Notice when you whisper, you can feel all that tension. It just makes it worse. Whispering is like the worst thing to do when you got laryngitis. Basically, just don't talk, okay? Just, you know, write things down on a piece of paper. Or if you are going to try to talk, just talk in a low voice like this, okay? Don't try to whisper. That actually is, is bad. It makes it worse. And cancer of the larynx, that's what you see on the right-hand illustration there, cancer of the larynx. That's really confined almost entirely to people who smoke cigarettes. Nobody else gets cancer of the larynx. But there you see right there. And what it is, that big cancerous tumor is sitting right on the epiglottis. And they're going to have to cut out the epiglottis. In some cases, they may have to cut out the vocal cords as well. And so, thank goodness, you'll still have the false vocal folds, which will still allow you to swallow without getting stuff into your trachea. But if they cut out, have to cut out your true vocal folds, your vocal cords, 
That's where you're going to need one of those little boxes. Hold it up next to your throat so you can talk. Um, that's um, Don't smoke, kids. That's a bad idea. <clears throat> there you see. E is for epiglottis. F is for the false vocal folds. T is for the true vocal folds. All right, there you see. And then the space in between the two T's would be the rima glottitis. Okay, that's the view you would get from a laryngoscope. All right, stick it down the throat and look and see what's going on. All right, so let's now move into the lower respiratory tract. Let's take a look at what's down there. So the trachea, that's what you call your windpipe, big giant cartilaginous tube. Then the bronchi. The bronchi are the big tubes that branch off of the trachea. And then the bronchioles are the smaller tubes that branch off of the bronchi. All right. Again, it's kind of like what we saw with the cardiovascular system. You know, we had the big giant aorta, and then we had smaller arteries coming off of the aorta, and then we had arterioles coming off of the smaller arteries. It's the same idea. The branches just get smaller and smaller. And then finally, the lungs themselves, and we have the smallest tubes are the alveolar ducts, and then there are the alveolar sacs and the alveoli. So <clears throat> notice in the left-hand illustration, see how it looks like a little bunch of grapes down there? That would be the alveolar sac. And then each one of the grapes would be an alveolus, um, plural alveoli or alveoli. So that's what's going on there. And then the little tube that leads most directly to the alveolar sac would be the alveolar duct. All right. So it's just the alveolar duct is the very last branch. After that comes the alveolar sac, which is made up of individual alveoli. All right, so the trachea extends from the larynx, that's C5, to the superior border of T5. <clears throat> Again, your, your spinal cord provides your vertebrae, providing natural landmarks for, um, for talking about where things are in the body. Do that a lot in nursing school. You'll find things by knowing, you know, what level of the spinal column they're at. 10 to 12 centimeters of windpipe. So again, two and a half centimeters an inch. So that's four to five inches, basically. Windpipe, trachea, four to five inches long. The C-shaped hyaline cartilage, cartilage rings maintain the patency of the airway. So what happens is you have the cartilaginous rings, they're called. And if you go back and look at previous illustrations, you can see that on the posterior side, there's a little space between them. That's where the esophagus fits in. So the esophagus is directly behind your trachea. Well, like if you're really pigging out and swallowing a big blob of food, bolus is the word we use, a big bolus of food, it might actually press on your trachea and you could potentially close off your trachea while you were swallowing. Well, except that you can't. But that's because of the cartilaginous rings, the C-rings, as they often call them. The C-rings guarantee that even when you pig out and swallow a giant, massive bolus of food, you will still be able to breathe because the trachea will stay open due to the cartilaginous rings. 16 to 20 partial rings, they go around the front, but they have a little opening in the back. That's, again, where the esophagus fits in. Partial rings allow the trachea to collapse slightly so that food can pass down the esophagus. And then the carina, um, so notice in the illustration on the right, <clears throat> that's where the trachea ends and the two bronchi begin. So that's at the so-called bifurcation of the bronchi. The inside of the carina has a very sensitive membrane, all right, so that if you inhale anything at all, um, it'll hit that membrane and that triggers the cough reflex. You've had that happen before. You know, like if you're, whatever, in a smoky area or a dusty area, and you take a breath and suddenly you feel that massive urge to cough, and you basically have a coughing fit for like a couple of minutes, what happened was you breathed in some sort of particulate matter, and it went down your trachea, and it went kabonk, and hit the carina, and that sensitive mucous membrane then has a nerve going straight to the medulla oblongata, and it says, oh my God, we got garbage in here. Get it out. And the medulla says, okay, start coughing. And that's what you do. That's your cough reflex. Remember medulla oblongata. Coughing, sneezing, vomiting, all that stuff. Survival reflexes. This is survival. If you got junk going down to your lungs, that can't be. You have to get it out. So a tracheotomy versus a cricothyrotomy. 
So a tracheotomy is insertion of a tube into the trachea. So the upper illustration, you see that. Um, permanent modification used in cases of severe facial trauma, head and neck cancer, tumors, etc. Um, this is something respiratory therapists, you'll get to deal with this, that put that tube in there. And this is how people breathe. This is how you have to breathe for the rest of your life. For some reason, your, you know, your nasopharynx and oropharynx are not working. Some blockage, whatever, because of surgery, it's all blocked off. Um, so you have to breathe through that little um, tube, all right, through the little tube that's in your um, trachea. Uh, the operation is called a tracheotomy. Um, that tube, by the way, has to be kept clean and clear, so you're constantly having to clean it out of mucus, because mucus and stuff builds up in there. Um, and respiratory therapists tell you that's a smell you won't forget. You have to suction it frequently, because if it gets clogged up, then that person can't breathe. That's the only way this person can breathe now. They can't breathe through their nose or mouth. And you have to humidify it, because remember I said before, it was important your nasal, your nasal cavity was um, warming and humidifying the air. Well, that's not happening anymore. A cricothyrotomy is instead a puncture of that cricothyroid ligament. So again, look in the lower left. So below the thyroid cartilage, above the crico, a cricoid cartilage, is the cricothyroid ligament. So in an emergency, you can punch a hole through that ligament, and that will allow you to breathe. So that's what you're seeing in the lower right. That's emergency only, like an anaphylaxis. If you can't intubate, sometimes... People, you can't get the tube down their throat, so you got to go in, and that's where they do it. Performed using a scalpel or a needle, tube is inserted into the opening. This is the kind of thing that sometimes happens. You know, EMTs, paramedics will do this. Um, you know, somebody's you know been like in a car crash, their trachea is you know blocked off. Well, not the trachea, but the oral cavity is blocked off. People can't breathe, so you do that. Um, you make the incision there. And uh, sometimes in an emergency, you've got to keep it open. I mean, you've got to keep it open, but in an emergency, you might not have the right equipment. Um, sometimes like a, a ballpoint pen, you know, the, um, the, the, the long tube of the pen, you know, you pull out the actual writing part, you pull off the end. Um, I've heard of them actually sticking like the tube of a ballpoint pen in there temporarily just to keep the person alive until they can get them to the hospital. And then, of course, they use something more appropriate. This is not intended to last more than like 72 hours, okay? Stephen Hawking apparently more than once had to have a cricothyrotomy where the, um, his throat collapsed for some reason. He had ALS, so I don't know the exact circumstances, but he apparently had to have a couple of cricothyrotomies during his life. So primary bronchi, um, the primary bronchi division of the trachea into the hilum of the lung. So hilum is a word that we're going to see a lot. It's basically the curved in part. Lots of organs have a hilum. So the lungs have a hilum. The kidneys have a hilum. The spleen has a hilum. It's, it's the concave part of an organ, the curved in part, right? And that's where the primary bronchi enter the lungs. So the right primary bronchus is shorter, wider, and more vertical. That's when little kids, you know, inhale something and it goes all the way down there. That's usually where it gets stuck. It gets stuck in the right primary bronchus, and they have to use a bronchoscope to go down in there and yank it out. All right, so happens more often than you might think. I read uh, one time a guy um, doing surgery. He'd had uh, problems with his lung for a while. They did surgery, and they found a piece of a Wendy's spoon in his right primary bronchus. I don't know how the hell. You'd have to be pretty drunk to make that happen. But he actually did. He had a piece, and they knew it was Wendy's because they could read the, you know, have the logo on the spoon. It was a Wendy spoon lodged in his primary bronchus. Supported by hyaline cartilage. Remember, that's the really, um, that's the really soft stuff, elastic connective tissue and smooth muscle all through that area. So as you go down deeper and deeper in the bronchial tree, you get less and less cartilage, more and more smooth muscle. So the cartilage is up near the top. That's to maintain that patent airway. By the time you get down towards the bottom, the cartilage would be taking up too much space. So you get less and less cartilage, more and more smooth muscle, until finally you get all the way down to the end. So great illustration right there showing all the branching that's going on, okay? So 
Notice you have primary bronchi, primary bronchi branch into secondary bronchi, secondary bronchi branch into tertiary bronchi, and then there are many, many more layers of divisions. But we stop numbering them after three. We simply call them bronchioles. I mean, it's ten, there's a fourth division, a fifth division, a sixth division, and so on. But we only number them up to number three. After that, we call them all bronchioles. And then when we get to the very, very end, we call them terminal bronchioles. And then after that, we have what are called respiratory bronchioles. And then we have the alveolar ducts. And then finally, then the alveoli, alveoli alveolar sac, and the alveoli. Okay, which is not part of the lower respiratory tract, would that be pharynx, trachea, alveoli, bronchi, or bronchioles? Which is not part of the lower respiratory tract? Yeah, the pharynx. Pharynx is upper respiratory tract. All the others are lower respiratory tract.